and I know there's more out there, but so far I've found several thousand pages of declassified FBI files on Adventists, where they very heavily intentionally surveilled uh, the church. They would come to our camp meetings and, and so forth, and they would come to our publishing houses. I mean, they have a list and they kept tabs on every single Adventist publishing house, including independent Adventist publishers. There were a few and all of our tracked and missionary societies. They had the names of, of, of where they were, their addresses in there, and they had agents there that would that would stalk and, and sometimes have stakeouts watching where the literature's coming and going. Some of our literature gets banned from the US mails. Some of it gets banned from the Navy and the Army. And, uh, and a lot of it's destroyed by the government during this period of time. The Lineage Journey podcast, unscripted conversations that aim to help you on the journey of discovering your lineage. Join us as we take a deeper look into past lineage episodes and see the lessons we can learn for today. Hi there, my name is Adam Ramden. I'd like to welcome you to the Lineage Journey podcast. We appreciate those of you who've been following our journey. And as we continue this look into our history, we're gonna be looking at a very important and interesting aspect today. I've got a special guest with me today, uh, Kevin Burton, here in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Welcome, thanks for being with us. It's an honor to be here, thank you. I understand you are the Director for Center for Adventist Research, Assistant Professor for Church History at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. That's your official title, did I miss anything? No, that's good enough. That's good? Yeah. And you're married with wife, two children. Absolutely, two and wonderful kids. Amen. Well, we're glad to have you here. Uh, is there anything else what you, you studied? Did you study here at Andrews? You study what, what, what's your educational journey? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I did my master's in religion here at the seminary. Okay. And uh, I wrote um, my master's thesis on Adventist history on a, a leadership crisis in the 1870s where the church ended up centralizing authority in one person, happened mm. to be James White. Um, it became the official GC policy for a while and then it got voted out four years later in 1877. Um, and then for my PhD, I've gone down to Florida State University mm -hmm. in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, and I've been working on my PhD in American religious history there. Okay. And um, I'm done with my coursework, my comps, I'm all but dissertation, ABD as they say. Um, and my dissertation is near the end um, and it's on, uh, it's gonna end up being focused on the Millerites and the abolition movement. Okay. I had to shorten it down from my original scope, which is including uh, the 1850s and 1860s after the Sabbatarian Adventists come on the scene. But there's too much to include, so okay. I stopped short. You just really focus on what, the 1840s? And yeah, it's really, well, it's actually, no, the 1830s and 1830s. 1840s. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, most historians have actually ignored uh, Millerism in the 1830s, but it, it's a very important period. And okay. I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I've got a couple of chapters that are just on the 1830s because it's that important. Um, and then... Uh, and then the rest of them are in 18, the 1840s up through the Great Disappointment in 44. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you're going to publish that book, I'm, I'm assuming? I hope so. Lord yeah. willing, yeah. I look forward to that. I mean, yeah. 1830s, I was just preaching on that this morning about William Miller accepting his call in 1831. And yes. Then, you know, launching yeah. his preaching career, so to speak. Yeah, and that happens to be the year that William Laird Garrison launched the Liberator, which was a very important factor that, that united abolitionists okay. and created a movement. And also the same month that William Miller starts to preach in August is the month uh, almost, it, it overlaps actually a little bit where uh, Nat Turner and his infamous slave revolt in the South, uh, the bloodiest slave revolt in American history, that happened in, in, oh, wow. in Virginia. Um, and huh. that, that uh, that along with the Liberator um, were two major factors that really launched the second wave of the ab abolitionist movement and sort of brought white people uh, around a cause for the first time. Blacks, of course, had been advocating uh -huh. it from the day one, right, sure, when they arrived sure. as slaves. Um, but uh, white people started to wake up around this time and, and, and a movement uh, started to form. So it was a pivotal year. Okay. And the fact sure. that Miller is launching his movement at the same time is, is an interesting coincidence. <laughs> It is. It is. Yeah. It is. Well, maybe we'll get into a little bit of that later on. Sure. Fascinating. Um, so I, I first heard about you um, about two years ago. I saw you on a, a live stream mm -hmm. you know, during lockdown. 
everything was on Zoom and we were watching people yeah, yeah, that sure. we never normally saw. So I was watching a live stream or a, maybe it was a replay and they were discussing. It was right after the George Floyd's um, terrible death and then the Black Lives Matter movement around mm -hmm. mid 2020. And sure. all of these issues were at the forefront, at least particularly society here in America, but also further afield. And and there was a lot of social media chatter on Twitter and Instagram and whatnot. The church was out of touch. Yep. And the church wasn't the head, it was the tail or whatever terminology we want to use and that we were irrelevant, et cetera, et cetera. But mm -hmm. at least a little bit I've known and you've studied much more detail, Adventists have a heritage in some of these areas, yeah. which is obviously what, what, what you've studied. So in the 1800s, and you just alluded to it there, how were Adventists involved in social issues? What social issues and to what degree? Um, and so what, kind of what's our heritage or, or our legacy or our lineage in that area? Yeah, sure. Yeah, our pioneers were definitely not out of touch with the issues of their day. And um, they were radical reformers. That's a very accurate description of them. In fact, Uriah Smith goes on. I mean, he, he and Ellen White and others uh, very strongly identify as reformers, but Uriah Smith and others are going to say and claim that we as Adventists are actually in advance of all other social reformers because we go to the root of the problem uh, and try to attack uh, the basis of all sin. Mm. And so they fall into a group of many others uh, that arise in the 1840s that identify as universal reformers, okay. where they try to find the, the universal reform or the fountainhead of all reform, and that's their main agenda that they drive and that will bring everything else, all the other evils in society into uh, the proper uh, righted millennial sort of order of, of harmony and bliss. Mm -hmm. And so Adventists are, are, are there and they, they are leaders in this, uh, in the Millerite period. And they organize conferences that, that bring the most radical reformers together in America. In 1840, there was a conference in Groton, Massachusetts that the Adventists there organized. Um, and it's not going to only, it not only launches the first Millerite General Conference, but it also is bringing all of the, the most radical reformers together. And they're trying to unify um, in their approach to attacking the churches over their sin of slavery. Mm -hmm. And it's the birth of coming out of Babylon and come outerism. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and when I mean the most major reformers, I'm serious. I mean, people like George Ripley and, uh, and A. Bronson Alcott and uh, all the transcendentalists, um, including Emerson. Okay. Um, you've got all of William Lloyd Garrison's key leaders that are right there. Um, you have a lot of other radicals who who are in um, utopian societies, and the utopian societies, uh, a new wave of utopianism is going to rise up um, in response to this this conference because a lot of these people are meeting for the first time, and it spawns many many other mm. conferences, and so it, it leads from one to the next. But when you get back to Seventh Day Adventists, they grow out and they come out of this sort of movement for universal reform and their approach is is proclaiming the the soon coming of christ mm -hmm. and so by doing so you are having to tell people that christ is coming soon so that means his judgment is coming mm -hmm. are you prepared are you prepared and see this is at a time adam when when most people in america including the north refuse to recognize that slavery was an unqualified sin and this is huge Hmm. So the abolitionists were doing so, but they're the only ones. Even in the North, most Christians are going to say, well, all, this, all the people in the South that, are, that own slaves, they're Christians. So how could this be, how could this actually be a sin, hmm. right? And so they find ways to excuse it and, and so forth. And the historian John R. McKivigan has, has shown that it wasn't until the middle of the Civil War in the 1860s that the Northern churches finally issued unqualified statements saying that slavery was a sin. Hmm. And so the work that Adventists are doing, are that they're trying to say, not only is slavery a sin, but guess what? God is coming, and we know that we have the date during the Millerite mm -hmm. period, and then after that date failed, they say, well, we know it's coming soon, any year now, any day now. So yeah. are you ready to meet your God? And when you meet your God, are you going to be prepared to go through the judgment uh, and have your sins uh, atoned for by Christ? Or, or is he going to look at you and say, why, are, why have you oppressed your brethren? Mm. You know, and so this so, is this is a major aspect of their approach. Yeah, go ahead. Just to jump in. Like yeah. Could, would you say that the Adventists around that time leading up to the Great Disappointment, would you say that they saw um, slavery as a sin? 
Oh my, my word. Okay, absolutely. 100% then. Absolutely. So because they saw it as a sin and the judgment's coming, you've got to do away with it. Absolutely. And the leaders are in full agreement on this. Okay. I'm, you might have, um, and there are, there are a few, you know, stray people out there. During the Millerite period, there were some Millerite slave uh, owners in the South. Mm -hmm. um, when you get to the Seventh-day Adventist period, no Seventh-day Adventists owned slaves. Um, but Ellen White does mention that there were a few pro-slavery um, Adventists, but she advocates that they be disfellowshipped. Yeah, I've read those quotes, yeah. Yeah, Quite so she, she wants to protect the reputation of the church. And we only know one of them by name, it's it's Alexander Ross, but the significance there is that he was in New York. He doesn't own slaves. He doesn't even own them, he's just sympathetic. He's just sympathetic, and that that alone is not not no. okay. So Where did the view, I don't know this maybe, where did the the belief that slavery was sin come from? Was it just reading the Bible or was there kind of a, what would you say is the root to that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the the abolitionists that rise up in the second wave, um, Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison uh, publishes these things on the sin of slavery. He uses scripture and everything mm -hmm. to denounce slavery as a sin. Um, and this is this is the root of it. And in the 1830s, especially, you see a lot more consistent belief among abolitionists that slavery is condemned in the Bible. And so they're very strongly uh, making that kind of claim with certain select texts uh, in scripture. Um, but then in the, by the 1840s, you have a lot of people starting to listen more to pro-slavery arguments and pointing out all the pro-slavery texts. And so in the 1840s, during the middle of the height of the Millerite movement, you have abolitionists starting to, to break apart. And, and the Bible is central to this. You have a lot of people, Garrison included, who are going to follow a tract where the Bible is, is going to be seen as more of an ordinary book, mm -hmm. um, not so much about divine inspiration, important as, uh, as an authority, but not necessarily the only authority out there. And uh, the Millerites are going to hold on to scripture and they're going to find, I think, unique ways. I've never seen anybody else come up with the precise arguments that they do in using biblical prophecy as the primary way to show that slavery is without question a sin. And the main reason and the main texts and passages for that deal with Babylon. Mm -hmm. So if you think about Revelation 18, 13, it actually is listing, it, I guess Revelation 18, 12 and 13 are listing the, the merchandise of Babylon. And, mm -hmm. and the end of that list is uh, Babylon engages in selling slaves in the souls of men, mm -hmm. bodies in the souls of men, however the translation has it. And so they say, well, clearly then, if Babylon is doing this, then this is not what God's remnant should be doing. And they connect that with other beasts and so forth in prophecy. Uh, in varying ways, the Adventists will, will focus a lot on the, the second beast of Revelation 13 that rises up out of mm -hmm. the earth. And so this all becomes part of uh, the warp and wolf of, of the Millerite and Seventh-day Adventist period. Uh, Enoch Jacobs, for example, a uh, Millerite leader who was the first to publish Ellen White, <clears throat> he actually says, this is a loose paraphrase of his quote, if anyone knows anything about Bible prophecy, they could be nothing but an abolitionist. You know, and so this is sort of the attitude, but they're carving out this niche at this at the precise time when other abolitionists are starting to question the authority of Scripture. Wow! And so they make uh, an interesting, uh, they provide an interesting alternative uh, to or or another way uh, to to advocate against slavery at a very time when the whole anti-slavery movement was just fracturing, splintering mm -hmm. left and right, mm -hmm. left and right, and so it was a pretty significant period 1840 to 44 in particular mm. all types of questions are kind of i know we're, we're way out of order fine, now aren't we <laughs> my mind, but, but that's fine but yeah um i mean let's ask this one that kind of brings us back like to sure. what extent was being an abolition tied to being an adventist in those sure. days is it like today if for example if you live in germany you say i'm german and i'm a european because yeah. you can't separate the two german european right so was being an abolitionist did you are the two together or could you, well, for example if you had 100 adventists would just say 60 be abolitionists or would 100 be mm -hmm. sure well in the millerite period you definitely have uh it's so uh so diverse and so fluid and flexible there was there were so many people just coming into the movement so quickly there was no way to have any sort of boundaries mm -hmm. and they weren't trying um that god was coming soon so they weren't so concerned and so for that reason there are there are some people in the South that own slaves. But it's interesting to see how that actually impacted them. So there are at least, there's at least one person we know who converted to Millerism and immediately liberated his four slaves. Wow. Okay. 
Other people, apparently, and this is coming from a slave himself, not from a slave owner who you couldn't trust on this particular point, but a slave in Virginia named Anthony Burns, who later becomes quite famous. Um, he makes the claim in his biography that he and all the all the plantation owners there accepted Millerism, and they believed in the soon coming of Christ. And he he says, this is another paraphrase, but basically to the effect of, when this happened, the whites and blacks enjoyed the greatest fraternity they had ever had. Wow. But then, of course, as soon as the Great Disappointment happened, gone. Huh. And so we talk about the Great Disappointment all the time in Adventism, but we've never asked the question, what was it like for a non-white person? Mm. What was it like for a free black person in America? Mm -hmm. What was it like for a slave in the South? Wow. That would be it was much more than just like, Bigger oh, Christ doesn't come. come. Like, it's your entire life that you saw getting better is now just as bad or worse than it was before. Yeah. And yeah. so physical, spiritual, mental, all of these these things are, are, are colliding. Um, but so that's that's the Millerite period. But when you get to the Seventh-day Adventist period, we're, it's much smaller. So the Seventh-day Adventist group, what we call Sabbatarian Adventists oftentimes, mm -hmm. they, they're only about maybe 200 by 1849 when mm -hmm. James White is gonna launch the present truth. And by the Civil War, there's only about 3,500. So we're tiny, very tiny. Um, because we're so small, we have the ability to sort of uh, patrol boundaries to a greater degree than the Millerite period. Um, and we, we previously mentioned how Ellen White had, had said that there were a few pro-slavery Adventists. So they were, there were a few that were hanging around there. We only know uh, Alexander Ross by name, but she says that they've got to be disfellowshipped. So that's a pretty clear indicator that you can't really can't do this. It. But there's another, there's another factor. In addition to all of the activism that they're doing, there's the fact that um, Adventists are against colonization. And so there's a person who writes in and says, can someone be a Seventh-day Adventist and support colonization? Now, what is colonization? Colonization was the idea, which some people confuse with anti-slavery. It was the idea that, okay, we need to uh, purchase the liberty of slaves or, or maybe, maybe we're not purchasing, but maybe they're going to be liberated. And then we're going to send them to Africa. Oh. And they're going to start a colony there. And Liberia starts mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. as this, uh, in this way. Um, but abolitionists were dead set, die hard against colonization mm -hmm. because they pointed out correctly that it was masking the racism of white people in America. Mm -hmm. what, the, yeah, what the colonizations were really doing is they were targeting free blacks and they were sending free blacks to Africa, trying to get rid of black people entirely. They weren't trying to get rid of slavery. Mm -hmm. And so it was only ostensibly anti-slavery, but in reality, it really had not much to do with anti-slavery at all. And so someone writes into the Review and Herald and uh, Joseph Harvey Wagner writes uh, the response. They're asking, can someone support colonization and be a Seventh-day Adventist? And they add in their question, I don't think they can. And Joseph Harvey Wagner says, yeah, they really can't um, because, and he kind of goes into some of these details and then he talks about the rights of, of, of all people, including slaves and especially slaves. And then he actually, in the same article, argues before slavery is abolished that they should have reparations for slavery. Oh, wow. Yep. Hmm. That was J.H. Wagner. That was J.H. Wagner, yep. Hmm. Hmm. So you've mentioned one. Are there any other examples, maybe like prominent examples of Adventists that are household names who are involved? Oh, yeah. I mean, I would say every every one of our leaders is involved, but okay. it, it depends on... I really need to explain some of the context and the developments here because... Okay. Joseph Bates is one of the, the founders and he is one of the clearest examples. But one of the reasons we have looked at him as the clear example is because he writes about it in his autobiography and he was a member of an anti-slavery society. Okay. Okay. But he, he says in his autobiography that he leaves. And so for this reason, historians have said, well, okay, Adventists, and like this is an example from Joseph Bates. We use him as proof of this. Um, they had an anti-slavery background, but whenever they became Adventists, they just gave up on it because Christ was coming soon, so why would you even worry about this? Mm. Well, that's not what Bates claims. Bates says he never left the abolitionist movement. He just said that he left the anti-slavery society. But he adds that he would, have not, he would not baptize anyone unless they first renounced slavery as a sin. So that was his... his, his, his litmus test. Right? Yeah, that was one of his <laughs> litmus tests, right? Wow. But what Bates is doing, more importantly than that, is not unique. I've mentioned briefly that the anti-slavery movement was fracturing, but between 1837 and 1844, it goes through a major schism, okay? And so what happens in the midst of all of this is the American Anti-Slavery Society, which is the sort of national organization that keeps them all together, in 1840, it literally splits. And in that year, you end up with three national organizations. The American Anti-Slavery Society, 
the rival organization called the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, and then a new uh, group of people called the Lib that are organizing a Liberty Party to, to try to organize, like fight against slavery via politics. But it was literally a, a one party platform over the like, we're against slavery, it's gotta be abolished immediately and we must have equal rights for blacks. And so everybody's splitting and what's happening there for practical purposes and to sum it up is that anti-slavery societies start to dwindle, break apart and fracture. And most abolitionists abandon anti-slavery societies. Hmm. Anti-slavery societies stopped being the driving force of the anti-slavery movement around 1838. After that period of time, they don't even calculate the statistics anymore because they don't want people to realize or it, they don't want it to look like they're getting smaller. Mm -hmm. They've been trying to use statistics about anti-slavery societies and numbers of abolitionists before that time to show the power of the movement, mm -hmm. but they can't do that anymore. And so Teresa Gadu, historian, points out that they have to shift to emphasizing narrative instead of statistics and numbers. And so what the Adventists are doing is what everybody, like most other abolitionists are doing. And Garrison's group, which had been, they, had, they were the ones that organized these anti-slavery societies, they become a small minority within the movement. And so the best way to understand the schism is that what happens is that it created way, it didn't actually damage and hurt the overall movement. That would be sort of a negative way to look at it. What it does positively is provided opportunities for abolitionists to participate in the anti-slavery movement by whatever means they thought best and necessary. Hmm. So it's really about tactics. Okay. And so what the Adventists are doing is they're carving out their own tactical response based upon scripture and based upon prophecy, and that becomes their driving force. But they remain consistent in that. And you see hmm. there are, our review, our books, our tracks are filled with anti-slavery stuff. And so it's 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 no joke. It, it's so serious that it's it gets to the point where these works, many of our, our publications are banned in the South. Yeah, I've, I've heard that before, so. Yeah. yeah. So like the Review and Herald or whatever that. I, not, not necessarily every issue of the Review mm -hmm. and Herald, but especially the tracks that we, we, we know of three or four of them by name, but any anything that would have denounced slavery. Was banned. Was banned, and that, that that's that's not unique to Adventists. So okay. in May 1835, the abolitionists launched what is called the Great Postal Campaign, okay? And that means within a period of just a few months, they sent over 175,000 pieces of anti-slavery literature to the South. Okay. Now that, to put that in perspective, that amount of literature was the, was the equivalent of all of the literature the South was able to print during the same period of time. Wow. Most printing- so flooded. It flooded it. Most printing in the US was done in the North. And so the South didn't have that much. And so mm -hmm. this is literally flooding the South. And they rise up in huge protest and they demand from the federal government that abolitionist material be barred from the U.S. mail. And they have an ally in President Andrew Jackson. And, wow. and Jackson yeah, yeah. himself goes to Congress and he, he lobbies and advocates. Congress rebuffs him. And so after that happens, he turns to the Postmaster General. I think his name is Amos Kendall. And he works with him and a couple of other people. And they pass effective measures that literally make it illegal. And they ban abolitionist literature wow. until the Civil War abolishes slavery. You're talking like 1840s, 50s. This is from 1835 through 1865. Wow. And so by the time you get to the Adventist period, they become well known enough. I mean, even though they're tiny, mm -hmm. that their literature is being classified as abolitionist literature by the South, by mm -hmm. the governments mm -hmm. in the South. They have no doubt that they're abolitionists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's not, a, not able to be circulated. Moses Hull, one of our ministers goes to Missouri. It's a border state, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, which is more more relaxed than than the deep south states, but they specify that if you sell any of this literature, we're going to fine you fifty dollars, which is a lot of money back mm -hmm. then, and you'll spend six months in jail. So that's no joke. In a border state. In a yeah. border state, and so James White will say in the, in 1862, he'll say that our literature has been positively forbidden in the South, and we've had many experiences of this where we we haven't been able to evangelize there wow. because of our anti-slavery principles. So like, let's just say, I don't know, a magazine would likely have articles on second coming, judgment, slavery. Yeah. And the, and their understanding of the two-horned beast was a, a very prominent feature. Mm, um, yeah, but, and so this is, this is a, a big factor. And so, and there, there sometimes were woodcut engravings uh, that were in this literature. So there's one of the tracks that's banned that shows this two-horned beast rising up out of the earth with the sea beast, right, you know, mm -hmm. standing on the sea in the background. And on the back legs of this beast, and this is one that Uriah Smith engraves, by the way. There's two chains, and one of the chains leads to a banner that says creeds, and the other leads to a banner that says slavery. Wow. And you see a train in the background. You see the telegraph line going around the, the, the sea there. And 
at a time when most Americans are using trains and telegraphs for this idea of, of like progress and mm-hmm. manifest destiny yeah. where the white man is conquering the, the wild west mm-hmm. and driving the native peoples out and the wild animals out and, and, and subjugating uh, black people and so forth. While they're doing that, Adventists are using the same exact uh, technologies as symbols of oppression. Wow. And so cool. it's quite radical to see. It that. is. Like, I mean, I've read, I don't want to maybe name the authors because they're, they're, they're prominent authors in our church, but you've, you've read, I've read the books, you've read the books about, you know, our history during the 40s, 50s, 60s, and oh, 70s. Sure. And after reading five, six books, there's, there's not really a mention of any of this. Right. Generally. Right. Now, is this not to, the phrase that some people use, is this a rewriting of history? <laughs> sure. or, or is this just, for whatever reason, did we just conveniently neglect that from our history? You know, like, yeah, put yeah, that yeah. on the table. Well, historians are always rewriting history. Of course. Yeah. And so that's what we do. And, and uh, that's not a bad thing. That, mm-hmm. that hopefully is a good thing. Um, and the reason that you have to do that is because you cannot include all of the history of our church in one book. It's impossible. Sure, sure. So if you want to focus on different things, you have to talk about new things. And so um, this subject hasn't been entirely ignored. Okay. Um, we have had uh, some popular authors who who will write things like they'll mention Joseph Bates and his anti-slavery mm-hmm. John uh, connection Bynes, or John Bynes and the Underground Railroad, but that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. And they don't really dive down. They're, they're, no one has actually seriously investigated this uh, before. And to complicate this, you have historians, trained historians, who have written articles and they claim that Adventists were ex-abolitionists, basically. That, like I mentioned before, that mm-hmm. Joseph Bates abandons the anti-slavery oh, society, dude. so he's a former abolitionist, not a current one. Mm. And so that sort of narrative has been in tension with things that you would read in like the Review and Herald or Signs of the Times, or maybe hear some preacher say from the pulpit. And so I went into my research because I was like, well, who's right? You know, normally I would say the historians are right, but I recognize that no one had actually studied this in detail. The most detailed study of it is is really only one book chapter of about maybe 10 pages. Mm. And so I said, well, there's a lot more that needs to be explored here. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had no idea what I was going to find. And uh, one of the earliest things I found was all about Joseph Bates. And I said, well, I've read about Joseph Bates. I went back to his autobiography. I saw what he said there. But I was like, he says he's an abolitionist. He's the uh, president of the Fair Haven Anti-Slavery Society. But what does that mean? Like I, I knew enough by the uh, mm-hmm. about the movement at that point. I was like, is he following Garrison? Is he going with the Liberty Party? What what is he doing mm-hmm. here? And so I started to search, and that's when I found like his petitions, and I found many other things, like several other things in newspapers that that we had never seen before. But his petitions have been the most moving thing I have found about Joseph Bates. Wow, it's because it's not just anti-slavery was more than just trying to abolish slavery. They were also advocates of equal rights for blacks. Now, they, they often failed there. They're, it's a little bit inaccurate to say that they are anti-racist or not racist because they were a product of their time. And mm-hmm. so from our perspective, they will sometimes say something that strikes us as, as very paternalistic. So. I don't think it's fair to call them racist, though, either. They're, they're so different from, from like pro-slavery people in the South. Oh, and so, so but it, it's just complicated because times have changed. Yeah, but you can't judge them by the language they use today with what, what's politically correct today. And so right, 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 right. Yeah. You got to look at them in their context. Yeah. And so when you do that, you're like, wow, they are light years ahead of everybody else. Mm-hmm. And so Joseph Bates' petitions, like he, he, he signs all of them, but he's not just signing them. Joseph Bates was circulating them. Hmm. He was gathering the signatures. And he does all of the anti-slavery subjects, like trying to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia and all the territories where they, they believe that the federal government had the power to do. Mm-hmm. But because of states' rights, and most people don't get this right about the, the North, they respected states' rights and were advocates of states' rights too. And so they thought that the states in the South had the right to have slavery. But the federal government could abolish it in the territories and in the, in the capital. And so they would circulate, he, Bates is getting signatures for those kinds of things. He's getting signatures for every other kinds of petition out there against the gag laws that are passed that prevent mm-hmm. slavery from being debated in Congress. He does all of that. But he has th- four that really stand out to me that are especially radical. <clears throat> um, one of them is that he is circulating petitions to have the U.S. government recognize the independence of Haiti. And so Haiti mm-hmm. won its independence through a bloody slave revolt, the only successful slave revolt in, in world history. And, uh, and it happened around the turn of the 1800s. And um, <clears throat> they are liberated from France. They win their independence from France. And France will recognize their independence in, I think, about 1830, 32, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. 
The federal government did not recognize their independence until 1862 under the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. Now, why not? There's a few reasons. Number one is because they don't want there to be anything that seems to sanction slave revolts. But yeah. abolitionists mm -hmm. like Bates, even, he's, even though he's a pacifist, recognize, well, if white Americans can get their liberty through violence from Britain, mm -hmm. why cannot slaves get their liberty uh, from their oppressors through violence? Mm -hmm. And so let's be fair about this. And so they thought that that was a fair approach. But then more importantly, is that most, almost all white Americans, North and South, did not believe that black people were physically, mentally capable of actually governing themselves. Mm -hmm. And so if you recognize, if your nation recognizes the independence of a black nation who won their independence from white you people, an ability to rule. then you recognize their, their ability to rule and that is a problem. And so these petitions are showing that like Bates, has these views. He believes that black people have the full abilities, capabilities, rights of, of white people as white people. They're no different, you know? And so that's, that's what I mean. It also shows his international concerns and, mm. and things like that, which I find, I find fascinating. And you can compare, they would take, abolitionists would take the same, all these groups of petitions together and they would gather signatures at the same time. And you can see that like far fewer abolitionists even are gonna sign these radical petitions I'm mentioning to you than they would the others. And so you know that they're more radical. The other two, one is to abolish uh, racial segregation on transportation, and Bates is, is circulating mm -hmm. those petitions. The other one is abolishing the laws that say whites and blacks can't intermarry. He's doing that. And then the final one is against the death penalty. And so he's he's wanting the death penalty to be, to be abolished. Abolitionists at that time also recognized that black people were just, uh, they were targeted a disproportionate manner and so forth. And so they tie uh, a lot of abolitionists tie these causes together. Hmm. And so those are petitions that he signs that make him stand out from others. And so you see that, you see his views, and you're like, wow, that's really, that's really quite remarkable. Hmm. Um, but he's not alone. I've, since I found those, those are the first I found, I, I was like, well, now, now I should just start searching for petitions because what a great way to get the, the views and perspectives of a common person. I mean, these documents are considered multi-authored. So like, if you sign your name, it's basically, you're basically saying, I agree, or it's like, as if I wrote this, mm -hmm. the statement at the top. And so I started searching more and more. I went to the National Archives and I've, I've spent several weeks now going through thousands of petitions, just looking for people that I know. And it's so tedious. I, I could tell you the process, but it, I won't bore you with it. But it's incredibly tedious because mm -hmm. you... <laughs> <laughs> They're not organized well. You got to know the names of the people you're looking for uh, with the place they lived at the right time. Then you got to verify there's no other people in that same town at the same time mm -hmm. with that name. It, it, it's it's complicated, but I found a bunch. And so he's not alone in that, that in that in those radical views. A lot of evidence shared those. Hmm. So so these this information's there. But I guess if I summarize everything you're saying, is really that there's been no or not many or none maybe Adventist historians who've really researched this topic yeah. on this aspect of a history. I mean, you said, I know you've probably got a colleague, Benjamin Baker's maybe yes. done yeah. some of this as well. But apart from that, I don't really yeah. know of anyone that specializes in that aspect of our history. That's right. Ben, Ben's work um, before, until recently, has been focused on Ellen White. And so his dissertation, which is very long, very detailed, very good, is on Ellen White's relationships with African-Americans. Okay. So he's not... He, some of it different and, angle yeah, yeah it's a different angle and so during the during the antebellum period some of it touches on that but he's, he's he's focusing just on her okay and so there hasn't been any other scholar who's focused on this period in mm -hmm. a broad sense of trying to so, understand so. And, and and get more well, and thank you for your work well because it, it opens yeah. up a, a an aspect of our history and maybe well well not maybe but i think it's coming at a time when it's it's very relevant for mm. our church to know this yeah I, I started long before george floyd's murder but boy after that it certainly has mm -hmm. caught on <laughs> among sure. people. So, well, let me yeah. just um, kind of maybe. Well, we're just going to take a short break in a minute. Yeah, sure. So, you know, we've kind of looked a little bit about Adventists and abolition in the 1830s, the 1840s, how widespread it was amongst early Adventists, Millerite Adventists, Sabbatarian Adventists, and so on. We're going to shift in our second um, part of this podcast. We're going to look into USA and its and our interpretation of American Bible prophecy. And I think you've done some research into that as well and see how our views on Adventist views on slavery, I believe, link in with our understanding of Revelation 13. So those of you who are listening, um, don't go anywhere. Our second half is going to be fascinating as we look in detail on USA and prophecy and how that ties in and how we, our Adventist pioneers interpreted these um, verses in Revelation. 
Lineage is a non-profit organization kept running by generous donors like you. Support us today on patreon.com forward slash lineage journey. History shapes identity, identity shapes mission, and a clear mission determines the trajectory of your future. Knowing where you come from is key to understanding your present purpose and your future mission. Linear's Journey is a series of videos that will take you on a journey through time, discovering the key people and events that have shaped the Christian faith. From the Waldenses to Martin Luther to Zwingli, from England to France, Switzerland to Germany, The light broke over the horizon of Europe, piercing through the dark ages and then spread out over the world. As the United States of America rose to supremacy, Christianity formed the bedrock of this great nation. And so from the Great Awakening to the Great Disappointment and beyond, lineage follows the journey of God's church throughout time, immersing you in the places, the stories and the people through whom Christianity has shone the brightest. Join us on a journey through time. Follow us on social media at Lineage Journey or check out our website at lineagejourney.com. Lineage Journey not only produces video content, but instructive and illuminating resources to teach young and old about Christian history. Lineage has produced an educational coloring book for people of all ages. It includes original artwork from Ashley Bloom, highlighting the various heroes of the Reformation. Each scene has a matching story, and there are also QR codes to connect you to the website for more information and to watch the videos. There are also fun facts and memorable quotes to accompany the scenes to color in. Designed for young and old alike, get your copy now at lineagejourney.com. Okay, guys, welcome back. We've had a fascinating first of our podcast. Uh, this is Lineage Journey. I'm here with Kevin Burton, and we're discussing Adventist and Abolition, Revelation 13, American Prophecy. And we're going to actually get into some other stuff that's groundbreaking research that I know yourself, you've uncovered. FBI and, and and that just sounds <laughs> fascinating when you just say that name in connection with Adventism. But we, we've looked so far about Adventism, uh, 1840s, 1850s, and so on. So I want to kind of come with this this question, and that is, you di- you have alluded to it when you, I believe, in one of you talking about the magazine and one of the illustrations that was in there. But how did our church's stance on abolition and of essentially being anti-slavery and you know, abolitionists, how did that impact our view of America and prophecy? As Adventists and our pioneers, we understood Revelation 13. The second beast was the United States of America. So how was abolition tied in with our interpretation of that beast? Yeah, absolutely. To fully answer that question, I want to back up to the Three Angels' Messages, because this is all connected with the Three Angels' Messages, and, and Jane Andrews and other pioneers directly link all of this to the Three Angels' Messages. And so you will recall from Revelation 14 that the first angel is saying, uh, basically warning people, the hour of God's judgment has come. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the way that Adventists are are connecting anti-slavery ideas with that message is this idea that slavery is a sin. As I said in the first part of this podcast, most Christians in America, including the North, did not view slavery as an unqualified sin. If it was a sin at all in their minds, they would say, well, God will just wink at that, you know, and, Mm. and they'll be let off in the judgment day. But Adventists are saying, absolutely not. You're going to be answering for this sin in the judgment. And Ellen White and others are going to say, slave owners are going to be uh, doubly punished. They're going to be punished for their sins and the sins of their slaves as well. Hmm. And so they have much to answer for in the judgment of God. And so all the way from William Miller in the the 1830s through the the Seventh Adventist period, all the way through the end of the Civil War, they are strongly advocating um, that God's judgment hour has come. And uh, they're, they're letting people know that the sins of slavery are a major component. And if they mm. want to be saved, they've got to deal with that. Well, the second the second angel is warning people to come out of Babylon. That mm-hmm. Babylon has fallen. I guess it's really Revelation 18 that says, 
come out for my people. But we've always connected in Adventist and Millerites connected Revelation 14 and the second angel with mm -hmm. the, the, the angel and yeah. yeah, and and Revelation 18. And so this idea of coming out of Babylon, and 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 that's what we do. The Adventist church is literally born out of this. And one of the major reasons that they're coming out of the evangelical churches is because they support slavery. Mm. And this is huge. It's also because the, these churches are denying the second advent. It's mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. though. And they never limited it to one or the other, even though our historians have mostly talked about only the, the second advent. I mean, very rarely do you see anyone even mm -hmm. mention it. There's a couple people that mentioned it, but it's really been dropped entirely. And so, but they're very, very clear. Like Jane Andrews says, uh, the, the churches we know in, in America are the right arm of slave power. And this fact alone uh, proves that they're part of Babylon. Wow. And so like they recognize this, they're very clear, they're very explicit. And so that's how they connect anti-slavery arguments with the second angel. Well, the third angel is also there, and this gets directly to your question, because the third angel mentions a beast that is going to make you worship the first beast, receive a mark and, and, and its image and so forth. And Adventists see that that beast there is the second beast that rises up out of the earth uh, in Revelation 13. So you have to know those beasts of Revelation 13 to properly understand the, the third angel's message. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they're that's what they're getting at, and um, and they see that very very clearly. They start to come to that 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 theory uh, in tandem with developments in the anti-slavery movement. And so you see, like Joseph Bates in the 1840s, he'll say things in his uh, his tracks that organize the church, and he'll say stuff like in his, his Second Advent waymarks and high heaps. He says this great quote, like in the midst of the Mexican-American War, at the tail end of the Mexican-American War. And he says, he calls America this boasted land of liberty, this heaven-daring, soul-destroying, slave-holding, neighbor-murdering country. I mean, there is no niceties there. Like, Who's the author again? That's Joseph Bates. Wow. And these are the tracks that are like literally bringing Adventists together into a movement. There is no periodical yet in the Adventist church. Yeah, yeah. This is... This is bringing the sanctuary doctrine and the Sabbath doctrines together and forming our movement. And they're reading these things and they're they're not sh obviously if they were offended by that they wouldn't join the movement mm. and so they're they're bringing this together so so Adventists bring in this very critical attitude toward America and then 1850 the major factor that changes the ball game for Adventists that helps them understand prophecy better is the fugitive slave law mm -hmm. and so the fugitive there had been a fugitive slave law since the Constitution um, and so forth since the 17 you know 1790s. And, but it didn't have much teeth. It didn't really have the ability to really uh, get the job done, I guess mm -hmm. you could say. Um, and so in 1850, in a compromise measure, um, the, the federal government will pass this law that, that basically requires any Northerner to assist slave catchers in, in catching their slaves. Mm -hmm. And if they're found harboring a, a fugitive slave, th excuse me, they're gonna risk um, a $3,000 fine and you need to understand that the average worker is making about $1,000 a year at this time. So that's like mm. three Three-year years wages, so. mm -hmm. okay, plus six months in jail. So losing another half year's work on top of that. This, this if you're caught, it's going to cripple your family for, for a long, long time, mm. many, many years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's no joke. And so this law is passed in 1850, in September. Um, but it starts to be discussed like fury in Congress in, in the early part of the year, I think about February. And so by the midsummer, anti like abolitionists are uh, sorry, abolitionists are organizing these anti-fugitive slave law conventions in various places mm -hmm. in Amer in the north. And one of the most significant was held in uh, held in um, Madison County, New York. And this is uh, the home county of Garrett Smith, a very prominent abolitionist who by the way had been a millerite and still continue to hold Adventist views and uh, by this point was keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Okay. And so he has a lot of connections with Adventists. Um, he's he's uh, the shining light there. Frederick Douglass is gonna be there. Many other big name abolitionists are gonna be there. And this is the county of uh, an Adventist pioneer named Samuel W. Rhodes. This is where he lives. He, he actually, I found documentation that he actually had been in Garrett Smith's mansion and had eaten at his table. Garrett Smith, by the way, would have been equivalent of a multi-billionaire in today's money. So he was he was he was a land baron and loaded, <laughs> but a radical abolitionist. So so Samuel Rhodes knew this guy personally, um, and so it's Samuel Rhodes who, in the summer of 1850, as this is all going on, um, he actually starts to to preach this idea that America is this beast, 
and he creates a prophecy chart. We don't have it today. Mm. Um, it's probably one he just personally created, maybe he painted it himself. Mm -hmm. We don't know. But he puts this beast of Revelation 13 on there. And it starts to go around slowly in Adventist circles. And over the next several weeks, months, and so forth, it starts to catch on and catch on. By October, shortly after uh, the Fugitive Slave Law has been passed and into law by President Millard Fillmore, Ellen White has a vision. And she sees in vision, she's at the home of Otis Nichols, and she sees in vision that this is God's truth. And so they start to, advocate, she advocates that they make these prophecy charts uh, for the wider public. And Otis Nichols, in, the, in January, he'll start working on it. And by January 1851, he will have produced a, uh, the first Seventh Adventist prophecy chart. And this two horned beast is on there. And they're identifying it as uh, connected with America. Um, and so this is start, gonna start be the, the thing that they use to preach all of their doctrines everywhere they go. Hmm. And so as they're doing this, it's, 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 it's more and more strongly as these things are going on, they're, they're becoming bolder and bolder and bolder as they're preaching against anti-slavery, but it becomes the main way that they're doing this. And so they're denouncing America as this beast of revelation. Why? Well, it has two horns, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of those horns, uh, it's, they're lamb-like. It's a lamb-like beast, right? But it speaks like a dragon and it has two horns. And the horns are lamb-like because they are good things. And America is founded on these two principles. And there are historians who even uh, acknowledge that these are the two principles that have founded America. Um, one is that there is this idea of religious liberty, mm -hmm. and the other one is sometimes called civil liberty or republicanism or mm -hmm. something to that effect. Mm -hmm. that all they, they all mean the same thing, but they're synonyms that, that, that connect the, the words together. And so these are the things, the two horns, republicanism or civil liberty. It's easier to see civil liberty and religious liberty. Those are the two horns. And so those are great. And America claims to give that, like all men are created free and equal, da 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 mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff, First Amendment rights, everything. But they're saying it speaks like a dragon because we see right now that it's denying religious liberty to religious minorities, but they don't talk about that as much. They do talk about blue laws sometimes. Mm -hmm. But the main thing that they're talking about is anti-slavery. And they're saying America's denying equal rights for blacks. So clearly it is, uh, and, and, and because of slavery, it is uh, this beast. Mm -hmm. And they, they talk about it in the present. And so they, they're claiming that America is currently this dragonic beast. And they're listing all of these things. And, and one of the most amazing things I've, I've found, it gets to the point where Uriah Smith in one issue of the review, a full page, there's so many ways to illustrate this, but this is a fun one. There's, there's a full page where Uriah Smith has two columns and one of them is listing all of the declarations of, of equal liberties mm -hmm. and, and so forth and rights for Americans in one column. And then and he puts like lamb-like uh, the, as the heading of that column. And then he puts like dragonic as the heading of the other. And it's listing side by side all of the laws in America that deal with slavery and uh, anti-black laws that, and it shows the real nature of America denying these rights for blacks. It doesn't say anything about the Sunday law. Mm. <laughs> it's all about slavery. Fascinating. And that was the that was the driving force, as Uriah Smith called it, for their 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 argument for uh, identifying America that day, uh, in that day, which makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to convince Americans like to believe that their country is a beast in Revelation, would you want to lead off with a proprietary notion? that hardly anyone believes in that the Sabbath is really the seventh day. Mm. And like by uh, making people work on Sunday that this is a violation of, of God's law and proves it's a beast. No, 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 no. You're gonna have a much better chance of winning converts if you can show something that at least more people, even if it's not everybody, mm. are gonna believe in and that is that slavery is a sin. Mm. And so <laughs> that's their driving force. They, they mm. talk about Sunday law some, but it's, it's primarily, it's primarily this. So they really saw America as this conflicted nation, mm -hmm. which had Lamb-like qualities, sure, which people still, you know, lift up today, sure. But it had these real dragonic qualities that were present at the time. Absolutely, absolutely. And they they saw these two as kind of coexisting. Yeah, they liked the ideals. I think the ideals. Mm -hmm. I think they agreed with and were founded on principles of the Reformation, etc. But the reality is what mattered. Mm -hmm. The reality is what matters, and so they don't talk about the ideals so much. I mean. They're, they're really talking about, well, look at what it really is. It's a dragon. <laughs> so was this, was this view at the time when, I mean, maybe we, you've, maybe you've answered it early in the sense that we were only a really small movement. We only had like 2,000 or 3,000 people. But was this viewed as being like anti-American at the time? Or was mm -hmm. it just, you know, like, or did they, well, obviously they didn't get flack from people who joined because they joined knowing yeah. this, this, this was where we stood. Or was it common in other denominations? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, I have never seen anybody in the North upset about it. 
Okay. Um, but we have seen people in the South, right? As mm -hmm. I mentioned in the first part of the podcast, yeah. these, these ideas were banned and, and outlawed in the South mm -hmm. um, with federal uh, uh, backing <laughs> by the post office, right? So, um, so yeah, this is, this is uh, it's a divided nation. And so the South definitely sees it as un-American. Okay. Uh, but, but the North, um, if they did, uh, I've never seen it. So okay. I don't think so. But that okay. does change. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So it, in a sense, it's possible to speak against the nation. I mean, I've, the pioneers saw America both positive and negative. I think I've read a quote where um, Jay and Andrews or Bates, one of them says that the Declaration of Independence should have said all men are created equal except 3.5 million because yep, yep. America clearly yep, yep, yep. at the time had you know, millions of people enslaved. Now. We understand Revelation 13, most people, verse, I think it's verse 12 or verse 11, there was a, another beast came up out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. Now what you're just saying is that there's no time gap between the two horns like a lamb and speaking like a dragon. There's no, there's not a gap there. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll just speak personally, I, I, I used to work full time as an evangelist. What that would mean is for those listening, I would travel around the country and I would speak seminars on Bible prophecy. And one subject that would always come up is American Bible prophecy would have to kind of speak on this subject. And when I would speak on it, and when even when have studies on it, we would always put a time gap between the lamb-like qualities of America and the dragon-like qualities of America. And we, I would always say, well, America currently is lamb-like. It's in the process of becoming like a dragon. Mm -hmm but it's not yet speaking like a dragon. right? And we'd use other things, whether it's a Sunday law or, or religious laws in the future, to say that's when America will speak like a dragon, future tense, but currently it's not, it's still lamb-like and you can still be happy you're an American kind of thing. You know? Right, right, right. But <laughs> you're saying that our pioneers didn't didn't have this gap. They, they did not. It was, it was <laughs> lamb-like and dragon-like simultaneously, and slavery was the example of that. If there was any kind of a gap, they would have pointed to the founding of America and say okay. it was founded at a, in, in some sort of pure way. But they recognized slavery had been there from the beginning. And Pretty so, much the beginning. yeah, so there's not really much of a time gap mm -hmm. at all. And they're, they're, they're of course, living in, in this, this critical moment in the antebellum period, and they see absolutely no time gap. They are consistently, uh, and Doug Morgan in his book, Adventism in the American Republic, makes this very clear. They're consistently pointing out that slavery is the evil that proves America is right now this dragonic the beast. Mm -hmm. So where did this gap come about from? <laughs> oh, it's not called a gap theory, but I'm going to call it the gap theory. Yeah. Where did this kind of gap theory come from? The idea that America's currently I'm like, and one day in the future, and you can see it starting now, yep, yep, yep. but it will become like a dragon. <laughs> why, why is there this gap? And I think you've done some research into this and where it comes from, and it's, it's a bit disconcerting, really. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I'm not the first to tackle this subject. Okay. So, so Doug Morgan, in his book Adventism in the American Republic, I just mentioned it. He he provides a really great, um, a really good analysis of this shift. And of course, any kind of shift like this is not like we don't look for a specific point where this like ah magic thing happened mm -hmm. and now it's just turned. No, it's not like that. But but World War One, uh, Doug Morgan has pointed out correctly that this is a very critical moment in the shift where you do see a pivot happening. Um, and so he was looking, he found the 1919 uh, Bible Conference minutes. And in that, it mentions briefly where the, the leaders are having to explain why they've changed Bible readings from the home circle and why they've changed uh, the chapter on America and prophecy there. And actually, I just gave you the, um, I think I gave you the revised title. <laughs> or maybe maybe that wasn't, I don't remember. I, I won't t try to tell you what the titles were because I don't remember uh, right now. I'd have to look it up. But, but what they do there is before uh, World War I, they are claiming that America is this beast currently, et cetera, and, uh, and, and that uh, there's no future period where America is gonna become dragonic. They're keeping these things united. But then the federal government comes along and they, they start to surveil uh, the church and uh, they request, really demand, that, uh, that this be changed. And so Doug Morgan mentions in only, in only one paragraph in that book, he talks about the Department of Justice approaching the Adventists about this. So I had read his book, completely forgot that this was the case. Um, and I've later found out that Michael Campbell, 
uh, talks about this in his in his dissertation on the 1919 Bible Conference to a, a lengthier degree. But there again, he's he, he used a lot of good Adventist sources, but he built upon what we knew about it. Um, but later, I, I was doing uh, my coursework at Florida State University, preparing for my conference of exams, and I got curious, uh, which is another story, but I got curious to keep it short. If, if we could find any uh, evidence that the Adventists had been surveilled by the government. Hmm. I guess I have to say one thing. I was reading a book called FBI and Religion, and one author was talking about a black Pentecostal group. And of course, this is a time when blacks are very oppressed um, and so forth in America uh, around World War I. And the author shows how a, an agent for the what becomes the FBI, they were called just the BI, the Bureau of Investigation mm -hmm. at the time. He says that these people are dangerous, but they're not as dangerous as the Seventh-day Adventists. Wow. And, not as dangerous as the Adventists. Yeah. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Like, how is that the case? Like during this very racist period that someone would say that black people are not as racist now, I mean, as, as much of a threat, uh, you know, and of course they're not. It, it, so it means we must have been surveilled as but, well. But like, but like for, a, for a racist white person to say that back then, it's like, well, they, well, they must have really looked at us as very, very threatening. Mm. And so I followed his footnotes and I said, well, where is he finding this? And so I, I found it and, and declassified FBI files. And then I said, was there more? <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I just kept digging and digging and it ended up like hijacking my time for several weeks, um, which was so fun, but like it took, it took a long time, but I, I, I found, and I know there's more out there, but so far I've found several thousand pages of declassified FBI files on Adventists where wow. they very heavily intentionally surveilled uh, the church. And so oh, they'd, <clears throat> they'd listen to our sermons, read our literature. They would come to our camp meetings and, and so forth. And they would come to our publishing houses. I mean, it was way beyond what we knew before. It was way beyond Bible readings for the home circle. It was way beyond that. Mm. Bible readings for the home circle, I'll come back to that. That was very important. But but they, for example, they 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 have a list and they kept tabs on every single Adventist publishing house, including independent Adventist publishers. There mm. were a few. And all of our tract and missionary societies. They had the names of, of, of where they were, their addresses in there, and they had agents there that would that would stock and, and sometimes have stakeouts watching where the literature is coming and going. Wow. Some of our literature gets banned from the US mails, some of it gets banned from the Navy and the Army, and uh, and a lot of it's destroyed by the government during this period of time. And so they come to us and they say, You must change these things. And there's a whole host of things that they're upset us uh, uh, at us about. Like there's the non-combatant position we have, mm -hmm. so that makes you look like you might be, uh, you know, not supportive of the government or whatever. There's also the fact that like our constitution of the church was very largely European at this time. That was the second largest demographic. America was the largest, but like Europe was the second largest. And within that, it was the German empire, which included a lot more countries in modern day Germany. And so people from there are like in the church there. And so that seems suspicious that we have so many of, uh, of the enemy in our church. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there's a whole host of other things. They thought we were socialists. They were, they were convinced that our literature coming from the presses was all socialist um, because of, our, uh, of the support of many Adventists for labor unions and so forth, not all, but some. And so there's things like that. But then the main, one of the main things is our understanding of American prophecy. Hmm. So whereas this was not threatening to the North during the antebellum and Civil mm -hmm. War era, it does become threatening um, the war. during the World War I. And so, um, they had, they had literally just gone to the leaders of what is now known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. They were the international Bible students at the time. And they, they, they approached all of their major leaders because they're saying similar kinds of things, you know, uh, with their own unique versions of prophecy that were considered anti-America. And so they approached those leaders and they take them to court, take them to trial, they put them on trial and everything. And they sentenced all of them to 80 years in prison, but to serve consecutive, four consecutive terms of 20 years. And so effectively they're getting 20 years in prison and one of them got off with only 10 years. But that's a long time. Mm. And this is federal prison. This is not just a county jail, mm -hmm. right? So this is a big deal. It was three days after that, that they approached the Seventh-day Adventists. And they said, you need to change these publications or you're going to jail too. Mm. And so the leaders were really put between a rock and a hard place and for better or for worse, we can judge them, we can not judge them, we just say it how it is. They decided to censor our publications. And so it wasn't just Bible readings for the home circle. Mm -hmm. That was perhaps the most significant, but they were numerous tracks um, and in periodicals too, where they would try to sh say, can we publish this before we you know, print this or not? And they would, they would get approval before they did. So you can actually see some of our tracks that will have the, the statement that says, 
passed by chief military censor and they give the date, okay? But what's different is that Bible wow. readings from the home circle doesn't specify or say anywhere that it was censored, but it was. And so at the 1919 Bible conference, the leaders of the church are having to explain to all the pastors and history teachers that are there why they did this, which is why Doug Morgan and Michael Campbell caught it. <clears throat> and so Doug, as he's, as he's rightly shown, this is a major pivot. And so one of the biggest deals here is, is what we've been talking about is that around this time and in this book, in Bible readings from the home circle, which had sold well over a million copies by this point, it was a massively influential text. It pivots in time it's that subtle shift where we don't say, where we had been saying America is currently this beast, we're now gonna say it's gonna be a, a beast later. And you're absolving the government of any guilt so that you can look patriotic, sound patriotic, be a good American citizen, not be sus you know, suspected by the government. Religious liberty, civil liberty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, it will seem as though you're still holding on to what we've always taught and believed. Mm -hmm. But that subtle shift is huge. Massive. And so it's not the only factor that's that's helping to shift Adventist understandings of race relations, but it's an important factor. And it shows that it's there's outside influence from mm. the federal government itself that's playing a role. I mean, there's other things. Adventists are going down south, they're evangelizing, and a lot of former Confederates are converting to Adventism, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we start to see a lot of things happening, but it's part of the package that gets to the point where in the 20th century, our radical stances on race are completely wiped out. And we become just like all the other racist white Americans. And we, we start to have segregated churches, segregated institutions. And then we become one of the last institutions, religious institutions to actually desegregate. desegregate. Yeah. So <clears throat> just to bounce right off that, do you think that, uh, cause I've often wondered, like we were at the forefront of, <clears throat> of these issues. Like, yeah. Right. And then, well, to use our terminology, we went from being the head to the tail or whatever. We sure. just kind of like, we got, we became segregated. Do you think, this interpretation of Beast and Bible prophecy, America, its connection with slavery was kind of fundamental to our identity and then what we became later on? Um, I, I do think that uh, I, I have called and I've intentionally used the words, I have said that this, our understanding of, of uh, American prophecy in the antebellum period with its anti-slavery readings was part of our fundamental beliefs. Mm. I've, lowered, I've kept it lowercase, lowercase F, lowercase B, because they didn't have any fundamental beliefs sure, like we do a, today. They were actually against having fundamental beliefs like we do today. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, it was core. They put it on their prophecy charts. They put that beast on their prophecy charts and they're preaching everywhere they go, mm. this idea that America is this beast because, and then slavery is the main reason for mm. the argument. So you cannot deny, it's part of the fundamental warp identity. and wolf of our fundamental identity. And it wasn't just that one, it was also the first and second angels messages too. So in every kind of way, it's attached to our core fundamental beliefs. Hmm. And so it is important that it's shifting and changing, but one thing that might help us understand this historically at least, is that there are some analogous cases to Adventists. We're not the only uh, abolitionist group that had this shift. Okay. A historian has written an article um, showing how the Wesleyan Methodist connection, they split and break off in 1843 and 1844, Millerites are involved in this split, make, helping to make it happen too. And they are breaking off from the Methodist Episcopal Church <clears throat> and they form and establish an anti-slavery denomination where it's like you, if you, you cannot be an, a, a pro-slavery person in any way and be a member. Um, similar to Adventists, it's one of the, the very few actual anti-slavery churches uh, in America. And so they're staunch abolitionists, just like we are in, mm -hmm. in the antebellum period. But but by the early 20th century, around the same time, mm. they have shifted and they have, they have, they have become fundamentalists um, in a large way, just like Adventists have done. And their, their stance, their radical positions on race have shifted and they've become very conservative in that sense. Mm. And, um, and they've become part of the problem in America, whereas they were the solution previously. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. Were they surveilled as well? <laughs> I don't, you know, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't know that they were surveilled and I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, they end up kind of dying off. I don't know that they exist okay. anymore. Okay. So like they may have just kind of gone back with the Methodist and I don't remember when they've united. So, but I don't know if they were surveilled. It's sure. a great anyway. question. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got this shift in our understanding from basically the 1920s onward. Yeah. And maybe just to bring it to today, because America got, has gone through some pretty traumatic times in the last hundred years. You've Oh yeah, the civil rights mm -hmm. movement and and so on. It's almost like if if you imagine how that 
passage of scripture would have been interpreted and made relevant if that shift hadn't come. Mm, yeah. You know, like whatever happened in the 60s or, or these yeah. types of things would have been fulfillment and a further example of America's the Beast. Yeah. Currently. Or the dragon is speaking currently, rather. Well, this this all really shows the failures of white Adventists. And I'm a white Adventist because you can't see me, so you should know that I'm a white Adventist. But it shows the failures of white Adventists because black Adventists never dropped these things entirely. Mm. And so they continue to fight for social justice. They continue to fight for their rights and so forth. Um, and uh, and you can see Samuel London Jr. has written a book that shows black Adventists involved in the civil rights movement. And then Benjamin Baker has, has added a lot more to his research, even though he hasn't published it yet. Mm -hmm. But you can go to his website, blacksghistory.org. And so black Adventists, we should affirm that they, they've never really lost sight of it's this. It's true. I remember asking uh, Benjamin Baker the yeah. question. He said, well, he said, we, we, we've we never had the privilege of separating religion, yeah. religion and politics. He right. said, it's, how, how can you? It wasn't a privilege that we had. Like, you could, well, you shouldn't have done it. Yeah, but, right. Like, they were always tied. They were always tied. Were always That's exactly tied. right. So, um, how do you think, and, and, and this is almost like, like you said, research that's coming out now, it impacts the, the relevance of the Bible and the message we have today. If we correctly understand these passages or understand them as we historically did. Yeah, sure. I think there's a lot of connects and I think that our pioneers uh, really have challenges from their grave. So I think that they have, uh, I think that they developed a radical uh, set of social principles that, that governed and guided how they uh, lived their lives and how they saw uh, the Bible and, and they saw these things as founded in scripture. And so, I think if we were staying true to what they were teaching, we would still be just as strong against racism and oppression today. Mm. But I, I don't, I don't see that we are. I think that we are. Uh, the General Conference, for example, is usually silent on these things. Whenever George Floyd was murdered, they said nothing. Now the NAD did, mm -hmm. but not the GC. Mm -hmm. And I'm not criticizing any leaders. I'm not. The, uh, this is not the point. But nevertheless, that's not what our pioneers would have done. Mm. They were not silent. Mm -hmm. They were not silent at all. I mean. The, what they were doing back in the time of, the, of our pioneers is the evangelical majority was saying, okay, we cannot get involved in anti-slavery because it's hindering the mission of the church. Mm. We need to be saving souls, not get distracted by politics. Mm -hmm. That is their argument. We hear that today. Sound familiar? Yeah. Right? Okay. They would also say, we can't do this because it's dividing the church. It's mm. bringing about disunity. Anti-slavery is dividing the church. So let's avoid it. Sound familiar? If we, mm. if we replace anti-slavery mm -hmm. with social justice? Yeah, yeah. And they also say the best response, and this is the majority response, is we must stay silent. We are about religion, not politics. We, we must avoid mm. these two. And Adventists say, absolutely not. Adventists, like all of the other abolitionists, are saying, no, it is not social justice or, or anti-slavery that is the problem here. It is slavery that is dividing and hindering the mission of the church. It is social injustice mm -hmm. that is hindering the mission of the church and preventing the salvation of souls and so forth. That is slavery and social injustice that is uh, dividing the church, mm -hmm. not the solution. You know, and they would say, you cannot be silent. And so many people today are going to say things like, silence is complicity. Abolitionists back then said that. That phrase mm -hmm. is, is used sometimes, but the most common one they used is that silence is crime. That's a tagline that many abolitionists really? used. Yep, Fine. Joseph Bates, uh, one of his anti-slavery societies, they passed resolutions where they denounce all the ministers and the churches and so forth and say slave, uh, silence is a crime. Hmm. You know, And so this is a, a major approach. And so if we were to be true to those ideals today, which is I think what you're asking me, like mm -hmm. I think that we would have to, to embrace a lot of things that many Adventists do, but a lot of Adventists are uncomfortable mm -hmm. embracing. Um, so as I see the, shall I go into specifics? I'm happy to yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, go ahead. So like some of those today would be like, uh, we would be advocates for reparations for slavery. Mm. Yeah, because I wanted to ask you like, what's what's the modern example yeah, or, right. or relevance <clears throat> or application rather? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's this. So like Ellen White, you actually find many times in places where she's advocating for reparations for slavery. Hmm. She usually uses the word restitution. It's, okay. a, it's a synonym. Anyway. So. Same thing. So she, we would be advocates for that today. It's a very controversial topic, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, like they've never been had any sort of restitution at all for for slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever we in, incarcerated the Japanese Americans during World War II, 
it happened a little late, but every one of them got a $20,000 check from the federal government, mm. you know? But when it comes to Native Americans, I mean, there's been a little bit there because of free education, but mm-hmm. there's been nothing done for, for African Americans. Mm. And so that's a major problem. And Avenue should be at the forefront of speaking out rectifying that. and rectifying that because that's what our, our prophet and our founders were about. Mm. Um, there's more than that. I mean, mass incarceration is one of the biggest issues today and it's the way that slavery is still alive Mm. see most people think that slavery in america is illegal and it's not Hmm. most forms of slavery like chattel slavery are illegal but there is one form of slavery that is legal and is protected by guess what the 13th amendment the very amendment that outlawed chattel slavery protects slavery in one sense and that is in prisons Hmm. and so prisoners are legally uh, you can legally require prisoners to work for free. That's true, yeah. And so <clears throat> this has become a major problem because after, like in the current era we live in, a lot of our prisons uh, prisons in America, at least, they're private businesses. True. And so they are, they're getting really f- like free or cheap labor from all these convicts, whether it's answering like telemarketing kinds of things or like making wallets or whatever it is, uh-huh. but they're getting all this cheap labor. And these private prisons, a lot of them have quotas. They require a certain number of prisoners to be there to keep their business going because wow. they have a contract uh-huh. with the prison uh, itself. The business and the prison have this agreement. And so the prison has to deliver X number of workers to this business to keep this going. Hmm. And so what does that mean? That means that, that the officers in that local region, gotta they've got to go out and find more criminals to, to people to imprison. And what have they done? Study after study has shown that black and brown people have been disproportionately targeted for crimes that lead to imprisonment. It's not because that they're actually more inclined to criminal activity. Mm-hmm. They're not actually, um, but they're being targeted disproportionately. And so that's led to this, this thing. And then the war on drugs and crime has been a huge part of this that's, mm-hmm. that's added it to it. Um, during the Reagan administration in particular, they, they, they made things like uh, crack and so forth, uh, federal crime. Um, and it's funny because if you do crack, it's terrible, it's bad, but like it's affecting your body. Mm-hmm. But if you drive under intoxication, you're going to get a slap on the wrist where you could have killed somebody else. Mm. And so you're going to get uh, you're going to get a slap on the wrist where you could have killed somebody, and you're going to be an actual felon if you if you get caught with drugs. Mm. And what happens when you do that? You're stuck forever because you're everyone's going to learn that you have um, that you're a felon, and so you're you're not likely to get a job. Mm. You can't get housing, mm-hmm. and uh, and so forth. And so like. How are you going to live? How are you going to break free from this? How are cycle. you going to? Yeah. It, and so you're stuck in a cycle. And and we have created now, we have the largest prison system in the world in the United States, mm-hmm. much larger than the most, what we might say are what seem to us, at least as some of the most more oppressive countries like Iran or whatever. Now, I, I have nothing against Iranians. I'm just saying that some people make that comparison. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't necessarily support that comparison, but nevertheless, we have a bigger prison system than any other country in the world. Mm. It's millions, uh, millions of people go through it every year. And so that mm. is, is a, as a major factor that we should be pushing against as well. And then let's talk about immigration. Immigration mm. is another major one yep. with uh, detaining people at the borders, the border camps, all the things that we have done to separate families, all of that, those atrocities that are violating the very commandments of God. Mm-hmm. How on earth can we sit by and even support that? You know, our Open pioneers, side. our pioneers would be so against that. There's so many texts in the Bible about caring for the foreigner. Mm-hmm. It's all through scripture, you know? And so those are things that, that we should be very much advocates of. And, and, and we should also not be afraid of things like Black Lives Matter or critical race theory. Now, I actually did my comprehensive exams in critical race theory. I, I did, I read tons of books on this area. I actually know what it is. Most people that talk about it have no clue what they're talking about. They learn from a Facebook meme. They learn, they learn from a Facebook meme, that's right. You know, and so, but, but we shouldn't be denouncing that. If we were going to be true to what our pioneers were, were doing, we would, be, we would be crafting Adventist, biblical-based, spirit of prophecy-based approaches to respond to show that we care about people's bodies and souls and mm. uplift them and care about their rights because we recognize that if we want to reach these people, they are going to listen to us more likely if we care for their physical needs as mm-hmm. well as their spir- spiritual yeah, needs. Yeah. So we must re-embrace that if we want to stay true to what our pioneers are doing. And it is radical. It is. It but is. they but were I, radicals. But I think <laughs> they were. And I think, I mean, we always talk about people often say, oh, young people get disinterested in church and yeah. things like that. But I think this issue and some of these issues really have struck a nerve with millennials and down. Sure. And that it's just like our church 
or our interpretation doesn't seem to have relevance today. Yeah. And I, I think if we understood it correctly, it would really bring the scriptures to life and it would show us as, as cutting edge, really. Yeah. It probably helps that I'm younger. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm not technically a millennial, but uh, I, I'm more of what they call a zennial because I'm born yeah, in the oh, mid-80s. Yeah, that, yeah, same here. But like, nevertheless, like I, I have felt that, that we've been out of touch too, you know, mm. and, and I... And I I was inspired. I personally have been very moved by our pioneers. I mean, I was not any kind of an activist. I'm not sure that I'm an activist now, but like I, I, I try to speak out and help people be aware of these things. And, and I'm an activist in that sense. But like when I saw those petitions from Bates, mm. I recognized that there was absolutely no excuse that this narrative that I had been given my whole life and I was raised in the South, so this is probably part of it, about how Avenists uh, should avoid politics is a complete, total mask for racism. Mm. Think about it. Adventists have always been political. Think about what we've done for religious liberty, all the lobbying yeah, we've done yeah. in courts, what we've done with to anti-tobacco. Mm -hmm. I mean, Adventists, if you, if you don't know this already, we are partially the reason that you have these like notes on cigarette packages that say smoking kills. Yeah. Wow. Part of it through the activists, uh, activism of Adventists. All we've done against alcohol, Oh, this is very political, mm -hmm. you know? And so when, when you have people like F.D. Nickel writing the review in the civil rights era and telling Adventists that they can't get involved with civil rights because it's political, at the same time, you see Adventists going down the streets, marching down with banners about banning cigarettes and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we're praising this one while denouncing the other. Mm -hmm. And it's really just duplicitous. Yeah. It's yeah. just masking oppression. And that same kind of thing still happens. And so... We need to recognize that. And so- Be honest with who we are. Yes, be honest with who we are. So, so this idea that we can't get involved in politics is nonsense. Now, I, I, we have to do the right kind of politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what we need to study more and, and go to scripture more and the spirit of prophecy more to, 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 to discern on what that means. But like our pioneers, when it comes to the issue of race, have gave us a very clear platform to stand on and stand on firmly. Well, I appreciate you sharing and just enlightening myself and those of us who are listening are really this this key aspect of our history and i really believe it has a, a relevance today as we can see and i think when if we looked at our history in a wholesome way or, or a broader way or all aspects of our history we would see that our people have a, given us a legacy that we should live on today yeah but maybe my, my closing question maybe what's your favorite pioneer <laughs> <laughs> as it relates to this subject in a way. And, and that's always hard <clears throat> to ask a historian, what, but, you know, but is <clears throat> it just maybe one episode or one person that just really sure. resonates and stands out? I've talked about Bates so much uh, uh, in this interview. And if I was to choose one, it would probably be Bates, but I have such a hard time with just selecting him because I am so moved by the things that James White writes and publishes okay. and then Ellen White. So like the mm. three founders of our church are mm. like, they're so rich and they complement each other so well in all these different kinds of ways. And you see such an amazing picture when you, when you put them all together. I mean, Ellen White denouncing the, the fugitive slave law and telling Adventists that they should Break disobey the law. federal yeah. law. Yeah. Oh my word, what a... What, I, know, I love that statement. What a mind-blowing thing. She's like, break the law and abide by the consequences. Of my word, what a mind-blowing thing. And, and so like the, all of these things are just so... They're so moving to me. I find so much relevance in them and excitement. I mean, these kinds of things help me to, to, to look at our pioneers in such a fresh and, and way. I love them. I love I love doing Adventist history. And I think so many people, young people especially, just don't even read because they feel like they're so out of touch. But it's like, no, no, no. If you take a look, you might get hooked here because this is amazing stuff. Yeah. Okay, so Bates, White, and White. Yeah, there you go. Your three favorites. Okay, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us and to share this cutting edge research and, and look, fresh perspective and and I don't know if I say new, but yeah, fresh perspective into Adventist history and given us a broader perspective as to where we should be as a people today and, and how we should relate to our fellow man. It was a and, pleasure. And, and in society. So thank you for being with us and thank you for who those of you who are listening and for being with us for this podcast. I hope and pray that you've enjoyed it and continue with us on this journey as we uh, taking interviews with experts in their field and giving greater insight into who we are as a people. Remember, our history shapes our identity. Our identity helps define our purpose and our purpose defines our mission in life. For more information, go to lineagejourney.com and you can find a lot more information on our, our ministry and our history and our legacy and our past there. May God bless you. Thank you for being with us.
Thank you for listening. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Lineage Journey is supported by your generous donations. Did you know that you can donate on a monthly basis? Any amount from $2 to $100 or whatever you decide through patreon.com forward slash lineage journey. Your donations go towards the cost of producing our varied content and we thank you for your support.